Matt, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to have you on today's episode. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing. Yes, yeah, so nice to be here. Thank you so much. So I'm Kat. I am the founder of a company called Tamarin, and we are building two products. One is Nectar, the other is Shiro. But in general, what we're focused on is making Web3 tech safe for healthcare. So what I mean by that is healthcare in general, either from the consumer side or from the physician and hospital side, has to have a different layer of privacy than what we experience in DeFi today or or just blockchain tech in general. So we're creating a protocol that is private by nature using ZK rollups and is also HIPAA compliant. So um, we've we've been around for a while. This is not our first crypto bull or bear run wherever we are now. Uh, we were founded in 2017, started as a layer one. We were a fork of Ethereum, also HIPAA compliant, um, different application to start. And we transitioned into L2 this summer just because we saw the congestion on the network and we saw the gas fees and we said, that's kind of the future of L1s that we've seen. And also if it's not like, you know, we've got Polygon and uh, Solana, uh, layer two is awesome because you can actually put a layer two on those super fast blockchains and you can make them even faster and cheaper. So we said, let's make the pivot. And that's where we are. Wow, okay. Super awesome. <laughs> can we break down just a little bit of like, what's a roll up? And I get the L1 and L2 layers because I'm semi-versed in Web3 and understanding blockchains and such. But could we talk a little bit, break down the jargon a, a bit so that anyone who's not familiar with what we're talking about will kind of get it? <laughs> yes, definitely. So we'll start at the beginning just for other folks. So layer one is kind of what we talk about is like the main chain, a main blockchain. So those are the ones that everybody knows, Ethereum, Bitcoin. Some more recent ones are uh, Solana, everybody really loves. So that's a layer one. And then the next layer is um, a layer you can put on top of layer one, which is layer two. And there are a variety of layer twos you can do. The one that we really like after analyzing all of the options is rollups. Um, and we really like rollups because when you look at the other layer two options, um, rollups seem to have the most, they're the most future proof, uh, at least from what the early research shows and the early development work shows. And what a rollup is, is essentially like if you imagine the chain and then a bubble on the chain, and then a bunch, like thousands of transactions are in that chain. And then they anchor to the to the main chain, the L1, only one time. That's a roll up. So instead of those transactions, like thousands of those transactions taking a ton of time and gas on layer one, you can actually group them all together. You still get the same consensus mechanism and it's way cheaper, only anchored once. And you still get the, the same security that you would get from, from the layer one. I see. Nice. Perfect analogy because I can absolutely see the bubbles and it's like it's almost like a big air boom bubble that I'm picturing. Right. And then it's anchored to the basket. Yep, and exactly. Having like tiny, like thousands of little balloons on a string. Essentially. Exactly. I love metaphors. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for breaking that down because that makes more sense. Um, and I now understand what a roll up is. So I feel more versed in this space. <laughs> Um, so you had mentioned that you've been around 2017. Can you, we talk about your credibility as a company since you had mentioned as well, you survived the crypto crash of 2018 to 2020. So let's dive into that. Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, part of our credibility, I like to call us like the second round OG. We like the first round OGs were like super early in Ethereum. Um, we were kind of the next wave in 17 and 18 and we, uh, we've always been building for longevity. You kind of have to do that if you're in healthcare, you work in healthcare, you know this. Um, it's not a uh, get rich quick scheme. <laughs> you know, you can't shill healthcare. Uh, you're going to have to be in it for the long term. And so I think that's why we were able to weather the crypto winter, um, also because we knew it was coming. Um, as a business owner, you should know that there's a winter coming at some point. And there were a lot of signs in 2017 and 2018. The ICO boom, everybody talks about that. A lot of people equate NFTs to that right now. 
Um, I am not like no professional advice, whatever. Um, I actually, this feels way different than the ICO time. Um, in the ICO times, they were, um, I mean, way more rug pulls than, than we're seeing now. Companies just way more companies raising multi millions of dollars and just completely disappearing. Um, so we, you know, we really, we knew it was coming. We as a team talked about it before it arrived. We were like, we know that there's a crypto winter coming. This is what we should expect. How can we prepare for it? Um, what we didn't expect was a pandemic. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened is, so at the end of 17 and the 18 is when we felt the big crypto crash. And I mean, it was very uncool to be in blockchain technology. Like we, uh, we pulled it off our website for, we stopped talking about it. I haven't done podcast newsletters, articles for since 2019, actually. Uh, I used to travel the world at crypto conferences. Um, that's changed because of, of COVID, but like people were not talking about it. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, we kept developing. We're long-term. We were doing the L1 at that time. We had received national science uh, foundation funding. So we've received a little more than a million dollars from the NSF. Um, so we had funding to keep going. Um, what we didn't expect though is, is COVID. Um, our application that we had at the time was supporting Medicare and specifically a risk-based program. And what I mean by that is we took on partnership with around 300 physicians financially in a way that if they did well in the Medicare program, there's a financial bonus that we all share, but if they don't do well, there's a financial penalty that we, we bore the responsibility of. Uh, and so when you're dealing with COVID, that's not great because as we see even now, our hospitals are overrun, emergency departments can't get regular patients in because we're overrun with COVID, elective procedures, a lot of hospitals were canceled. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of hospitals make their money. That's what uplifts the balance at a hospital. And so in April, 2020, I pulled out of the program completely. Uh, Medicare was not providing a lot of support. Um, and I said, this is too risky to be a part of. They're not showing that they are taking this pandemic seriously. Um, I knew we would be in it for two to three years and uh, shut down that application in total. Uh, we actually took that platform and turned it towards supporting folks with COVID um, safety. So we did a lot of testing support and then also um, vaccination, proof of vaccination for certain businesses. That's done really well. And we're in the process of uh, getting that platform acquired. So that's kind of how we've like moved through. Um, so we prepared for the winter. We had um, grant funding from the National Science Foundation. And I, even though it was super difficult, I closed down an entire arm of our business, 300 physicians across the US and completely pivoted. Um, and it got us to this point, so. Wow. It's really, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring as well to see your leadership as well, to know when is a good time to pull out, but also prepare because you prepared for that crash, right? And you talked about it with your team. And I think that's really amazing to, to have. And it's a strength to also be able to, to do risk assessment and be like, yeah, you know, this isn't in the long term. I just love, I value leaders who are really quick on their feet to also make those hard decisions to say, you know, this is where we were, but pivoting is what's necessary right now. And I need to save our company. But how can I also adapt to the current situation which was COVID, and now you're applying it to something that's more beneficial so Thank kudos you. to you. you yeah absolutely it sounds like you have a really great team you have really great oh, leadership yes. obviously <laughs> oh my um, team is awesome yeah so we're, cool. like a little, we're like a little family a little distributed family <laughs> it's beautiful and that's so important right it's like you have to have that synergy when you're in a business together or just just a team in itself doesn't matter if it's like a soccer team or a CEO 500 whatever fortune 500 company or a crypto company it's like that synergy is so important and I'm I'm learning that myself so cool yeah. how did you I'm curious what made you pivot to this space being in healthcare like non-crypto healthcare and then what made you what was that aha moment where you were like something needs to change and I'm going to change it. Yeah. So I, um, this would be a great article to send out with the, with the podcast because I talk about it as much as I can. 
So I was working at Yale New Haven Health System at the time, which is um, one of the six largest hospitals is in the health system, Yale New Haven. Um, it's a system that treats patients from a tri-state area from New York to Rhode Island to Connecticut, um, sometimes Massachusetts, so four states. And I had a great job as a hospital administrator. So I was in charge of growing the market share of the hospital for the medicine and surgery service line uh, for the health system. So I got to work with transplant, musculoskeletal, gen surge, um, ENT at, the, at Yale and then at our surrounding hospitals. So it was really great and I was super busy. Um, but within six months of being there, I got bored. I, I worked through my projects really fast <laughs> and kept asking for more. And then they made me a technical trainer and I created all of these systems and dashboards. And I was like, man, if I'm at the sixth largest hospital in the United States at the time, I uh, globally recognized brand, we moved really fast at Yale and I'm still not happy. Like there may be something else I should be doing with my life. So that was in 2015. And so then I was like, maybe I, I really started to like, this is the long answer. I have a much shorter answer for like on stage. Oh, that's so okay. I like answer. the long, go for it. <laughs> we like yeah. depth here. So, <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, in 2015, I had a long commute. So I, I drove almost an hour and a half to Yale. So I lived like wow. north of Connecticut and drove down to the south of Connecticut. Uh, and I really reflected. I said, look, I'm at a great place. I've always wanted to be at Yale since I've been in Connecticut. Um, I'm finally here. I'm not happy. So when was I happy and what did that look like? And in that reflection, I was happiest in college and in Teach for America. And the reason why is because in college, most of us know that have been to college, you have, a, you have full autonomy. Your output is like what you get, your goals that you attain is solely based on what you do as a student, how much you study, how involved you are, like your experience is totally yours and your own. And then in Teach for America, it was a lot of the same. So what happened in the classroom was, was up to me um, to get my students on the Texas-Mexico border at the same level of high income students in seventh grade science, I had to do that. It didn't matter that my students didn't have running water or roofs over their houses. Like when they came to the classroom, I had to get them up to the same level as other students. And so that challenge and that autonomy is what I really was after. And Yale had the challenge to some point until I got bored. <laughs> <laughs> and my director said, I'm not going anywhere. So if you're going to move up in this system, you have to find another department. And so the challenge was gone. And then um, the autonomy wasn't there either. I got passed over for um, promotions mm -hmm. from a colleague who worked less, produced less, and um, was less engaged. And so kind of all of that combined when I looked back at college and Teach for America, I was like, all right, so what career path looks the most to that challenging and full autonomy? And that was entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fine, that sounds great. I'll try that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started problem finding in healthcare. I mean, in healthcare in the United States, even globally, we could find a million things that we could fix. And so it really was a matter of what someone going to pay for, what are pain points, what are our administrators dealing with right now, and what am I really passionate about? So I first started, I was like, oh, let's connect all of the hospitals in the United States so that we actually have one, one database that we can all use. As if that was, I was like the first person that ever thought of this. <laughs> Um, and I realized really quickly why that wouldn't work. Um, the federal government had poured billions of dollars into health information exchanges, and they all had, and most of them still have, failed. Because, and I learned that process, um, data in healthcare in general, not just in the U.S., does not move because of business decisions. It is not technology. It is the fact that they are sitting on a treasure trove of data um, an asset that is worth millions of dollars that they don't want to share it. It's the same reason. And then also, so that's like the data that they sit on, but this is also why your physicians don't share information. So my primary care physician, if I, or, or if I was a primary care physician in the United States, I would be reluctant to share my, your data with a health system like Yale, because Yale is acquiring private physicians, primary care physicians. So there's a chance that I will lose you to Yale. 
because once you're in Yale's system, they will start sending you updates about your next OBGYN appointment, your next PCP appointment. Have you gotten your shot? Have you, we make it super convenient. And so all that's called leakage in healthcare. And so I could lose you. Um, HIPAA helps in a little wa- in a little way because they require physicians to share data within 60 days. But it became very clear to me that data is an asset. Um, data does not move and it should. But if there's a way that you could align incentives to move that data, then that is how we could get data to move in healthcare. Everybody's aligned. Uh, and that's when I found blockchain, actually. I was actually coming to both of these at the same time. So we're at summer 2016. And I started to see that Blockchain has an opportunity around data access, not a great database, but data access. And it has this token that you could use to create those incentives, to align those incentives, create micropayments. And so that's when I said this, is, and then on top of that, I was like, this is just revolutionary technology. This has to be core to what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it all just kind of lined up. And then um, I participated in a hackathon in October, 2016, was one of the winners. Um, and I was like, all right, we're doing this. So 2016, right before Christmas, I left my job at Yale and started the company in 2017. So amazing. That's the story. <laughs> Congratulations. It's an amazing, it's a, a, like an amazing timeline, really. And um, it makes me think something that comes up and, it, and I'm curious because you have the answer. I've always wondered the thing that frustrates me the most because I experienced it with my grandfather was he had, you know, like four different doctors, right? Primary care, cardiologist, and then endocrinologist, and then some podiatrist, I think. And it would be so frustrating because the cardiologist and the endocrinologist and the primary care physician would over-medicate, right? Because they weren't talking to each other. And so I was like, my goodness, if only we could just, if they just had the same health access to his records, they would see, oh, okay, you know, this drug actually, you know, counters with that drug and maybe I shouldn't double it. And we would have so many different arguments because they would not call each other. And so the patient was in the middle. I didn't know that that was because they didn't want to share data um, or I'm sure there's so many reasons for it, but that is like one of my biggest frustrations because like, wouldn't it, wouldn't healthcare just be such a happier place if everyone just could open one record, be like, oh, I see you had a stroke last month. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, do this. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. And so that's why our first application that we launched was focusing on that Medicare program. So the Medicare program was a value-based program and value-based means getting where physicians are paid for uh, the, the value that they provide, like how well they take care of the patient instead of the number of times that they see that patient. So when your health system, which is outside of the United States, it's not just here, it is globally, healthcare on earth (laughs) is fee for service. And what that means is that it is incentivized to, it is incentivized towards more procedures. So I was very drawn to value-based care because that is another way where you can align incentives. And that's a program that I worked on at Yale New Haven with the senior VP who ran the entire program. So I knew this inside and out, Um, but it turns out Medicare is terrible to work with. Um, My personal opinion is having worked with Medicare on the administrative side, we will never be able to get to Medicare for all that just will. And it would be terrible. It would be an absolute disaster. But value based care is moving in the right direction. And if you look at the investment thesis or theses of the advanced venture capital firms, they are finally like very openly talking about value based care. They're only investing in companies that are focused on reimbursing physicians for value over volume. So that's, so that's the other thing. They don't want a data share. They're super concerned about leakage and leakage, meaning um, losing patients. And then they're incentivized to not to do as many visits and procedures as possible instead of those physicians working together. So stroke is actually one of the Medicare, um, um, diagnoses in the Medicare value-based care program. So once the patient is diagnosed with a stroke, if they're in Medicare, they're followed for 90 days in this program, no matter where they go. And those physicians are supposed to be coordinating with one another to keep the cost down Mm. and keep the patient healthy, but it's not, it's not working out that great. So I think we'll get there eventually, but value-based care is kind of that extra piece of, of incentive alignment. Yeah. 
I like that. And it's so good to know that it's actually becoming more popular with funding round and, and um, priority because yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a really like big pain point for me personally, just seeing how many people are in that in that doctor's room, right? How many seniors in our low income communities just have to go to the doctor when it's like, don't actually need to go to the doctor. They're just pulling you in because dinero, they yeah. want that volume. And it's like, I'm like, why are we here again? Like we were just here a month ago. Like my grandpa's perfectly fine. This is just, you know, because he's got to use his Medicare, um, deductible or whatever. So it's, it, that's refreshing. I'm glad I learned something new. <laughs> I'm also in the preventative health space. So it's like, that's a whole nother topic, but knowing that value-based care quality can also hopefully eventually refer out to, to just more preventative health programs and such. So yes, I want to say I have hope for Amer American healthcare, but I think I have more hope in private sector. Health. Yes. Sure. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think sometimes I get frustrated with private health, but I think it'll encompass a broader population eventually. Um, but I, I really think that's where, where it's going. Yeah. So, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, last question, and then we will keep, we'll, we'll close it out. Um, why do you feel that Nectar and your protocol and Tamarind Health is so important. Like your mission is to bring this all to simplicity. Tell me more about like, why do you feel it's so important? Yeah, so I feel it's so important because I, you know, people, or I'll say the ethos of Web3 is, um, you know, user owned, uh, death to the monopoly, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just kind of getting back to the core, really getting back to the fact that the reason businesses are so successful is because of the customer. Like, yes, you've got good leadership and you've got a great team, but like if you didn't have customers. If you didn't have revenue, you wouldn't exist as a business. And that's what I really like about Web3 is it kind of goes back to the basics of why businesses exist in the first place and rewarding those that are helping the business grow. So I, I mean, and it, you know, other ways to align incentives. So this, this, we, this ethos of Web3 is highly applicable to healthcare. The same things that draw folks to Web3, DeFi, traditional finance, centralized finance, whatever you wanna call it, is exactly the same frustrations that people have with healthcare or don't even know exist. So the monopolistic structure of healthcare is mind blowing. So uh, more than $1.2 trillion of the Fortune five, top 500 companies in the world are attributable to healthcare monopolies. Fang or, or Mang or whatever, everybody like Meta, um, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google is only 930 billion. And Netflix isn't even on the top list. So among the top large monopoly comp uh, companies in the world, healthcare tops the list. But people don't know that. It's the pharmaceutical companies and it's the insurance companies, especially here in the United States. So monopolies dominate healthcare. And I think people are sleeping on it. I also think that Congress is sleeping on it. They're, they're focused on Facebook, Amazon, and Google. But what we're seeing is United Health Group is gobbling up physician groups. They're gobbling up data companies. They're gobbling up digital healthcare companies. And before we know it, they're going to be like, like Amazon, too big to break as a monopoly. They found out how to bypass those monopolistic rules. So I, I think that's really, really big for me. And then the other side is the data side. So that's really what pulled me in, aligning incentives around data. The inefficiency around healthcare just because data doesn't move is inexcusable. And so if there's a protocol that we can create that aligns incentives where the user who creates that data actually gets benefited from it, we can keep the market there. It's a billion dollar market. Like, we'll fine, we'll keep the data moving and, and flowing, um, but let's reward those that provide the data and first ask their permission, like actually ask their permission, like <laughs> we sign those HIPAA forms. Nobody knows that the hospital is actually selling your data. So I think those are kind of the big things is like the Web3 ethos should apply to healthcare. It's the same issues that we're experiencing globally, not just in the United States. Monopolies are, are mind blowing in healthcare and just get totally forgotten. And then 
yes, data is gold. It is a huge asset, but let's figure out how to align the incentives so that it actually moves. So I think, I really think that's, I mean, that's kind of the idea behind it. And then the other thing that's that I found frustrating in healthcare is like healthcare is super nuanced. It's very community focused, but I also believe because of that, no one company or one person will ever fix healthcare. So when we looked at it that way from a company, we were like, I could create, it's actually one of the reasons I moved away from medical school. Like I was in the process of applying and interviewing at medical school. And then when I realized that I have more of an impact from a public health perspective, like a larger denominator, I was like, I'm going that route. And then even now creating a protocol, we can have even larger impact instead of just creating one application that could help millions of people if we create a protocol that can help billions of people that would be really cool so that's kind of the angle of the protocol as well is is getting tools in the hands of other people that have like crazy cool ideas that we could never think of and just giving them a space to create that so that we can collectively fix healthcare globally so that's that's the reason for being. <laughs> I love it. I like to say like, we, we all win when we win together. Yes. And community yeah. just, it's, we, we can go so much further when we all partner together rather than, you know, kind of like the healthcare industry. I'm going to keep this piece of information and I'm not going to tell you how to do it. When it's yep. like, well, if we just collaborated and we both win together, like we both make our cut or whatever, why not? Right? Like, I just, it's hard for me. I come from a very generous, like collaborative mindset. So when there's stinginess involved, and, and unfortunately, that's just the nature of the world, right? You're going to have different types of people. Um, yeah. But I truly do believe in the power of community. So I love that that's your ethos as well. And um, I had a question and it totally escaped me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, do you are you in beta yet? Or how can people get involved? There's a token live. Um, tell me a little bit more about that process, because I'm really curious. And I'd love to support as well. And incentives are always fun as a consumer. So why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the first launch we're going to do is actually Shiro. So the application where you can connect stake and earn for your healthcare data. So we're going to be doing an NFT membership launch in February. Awesome. Um, so that'll be the first, like, we're going to cap it at a certain base number of beta membership users or member members. Um, so that's the first way to help is just kind of spread the word about Shiro. And that's global. We're starting with wearable devices. So watches, phones, um, then we'll move into medical records. It's a lot more complicated to do EMRs. We can do it, but we're going to wait a little bit. So we're going to start with wearables. Anybody can, can come into Shiro. So that's the first thing. And then Nectar will be launching at the end of this year. And so that's when we'll be doing a, we'll be doing a token sale. Um, and then we'll also be doing bonding, a bonding mechanism, very similar, very similar to Olympus DAO, um, has some great incentives, keep, kind of keeps everyone alive, aligned. So that's, um, that's the token side of it. And then in general, uh, we've got our Gitcoin out there. So we've we've received a lot of great donations. Um, yeah, so Shiro first, then Nectar, Gitcoin donations whenever. So cool. Amazing. So when you say wearable, last question, because I love questions. <laughs> love questions. <laughs> um, I like I'm obsessed with my Fitbit and people who know me, I'm just like such a diehard Fitbit person because I of course I'm come from a kinesiology background, right? So I love <laughs> to just track my health personally. Um, and I have an Apple phone. Some people are like, why not Apple? I'm like, I don't know. Fitbit, Fitbit just took me in and I'm just obsessed with the community. So does that, will that pair with Shiro? Yep, or? it will. So we'll be able to connect with um, Fitbit, Aura, um, Garmin, any of the smartphone apps, like the iHealth kit, and then the Google I don't know, there's some other ones. So, so there's around 300 devices that we'll be able to connect with first. Um, and that also includes the Whoop watch. There's like very, very tight communities about like Fitbit and Whoop and the Aura Ring. So we'll be able to bring all of that together. And then if you have information in multiple places, then it, it goes into a dashboard where it kind of brings everything together. So. Awesome. Woo, so excited. <laughs> I'm actually super yeah. cool. That's super cool. Yeah. Awesome. Tell me, uh, tell us, tell the listeners where they can find you, Kat. So they can support you and um and connect with you yeah so the easiest way to connect is on twitter so you can follow nectar protocol at nectar protocol or shiro at shiro health or me k 
Kuzmesk, K-U-Z-M-E-S-K. Um, and once you connect with us, our DMs are open. So super easy to find us. Um, I'm really active on Twitter all the time. Um, I'm not a great tweeter. I'm still learning. Like I, I got really good at Facebook and then now I'm kind of pulling away from Facebook. So I'm learning Twitter, but I am on it all the time. So that's really the best place to find us. Perfect. Excited for the future of Shiro and Nectar and um, definitely going to be in contact with you. Awesome. So thank, thank you, you so for much. your time. Of course. <laughs> <laughs>